Welcome to Talk Purpose and Truth, shifting you into higher consciousness, a show that elevates, uplifts, and encourages listeners to grow, heal, awaken, and evolve. Eden and Kim include bold topics, interviews with inspiring guests, experts, and celebrities, intuitive readings, channeled messages, mental health awareness, and hot topics to expand your awareness. Tune in for unprecedented truth, authenticity, on-purpose discussions, and magical moments. I wanted to, I'm not sure if I've ever really talked about this before, but my background is in special education. I have a whole like credentials in special education and I actually worked for 11 years. Um, I first worked with adults with special needs and a lot of severe behavior issues um, like schizophrenia and um, Down syndrome, autism, all kinds of things. And, and we would work on their behaviors and help them to um, be happier and have more peace in their lives. And then I went into teaching middle school, um, moderate to severe, and so most of the kids were in wheelchairs. So I focused a lot on, I taught, and I focused a lot on helping them learning to walk and physical therapy and um, a lot of educational stuff as well. And I had assistants and things like that. But I've always been very big on um, taking anything that feels like a challenge and making the most of it and overcoming it as much as you can to have the happiest, most peaceful, joyous life and, and just live up to your potential. I've always been really good at that and, and really passionate about that. And then I ended up leaving it because um, I had my daughter and it was taking up so many hours a week and I wanted to be able to create my own schedule. And so I was able to kind of delve into this, what I do now, and then decided to do this full force. Um, uh, now it's been like 12 years ago at least. So my kids are older. But I've always been fascinated by people who have triumphed over something that sometimes people feel is a setback or a challenge. And our guests are all about that. And so I'm very extra excited to introduce Doug Cornfield and Dave Clark. And they have a book together that's out now for children called A Pound of Kindness. And we'll go into what all of that is about. But they are all about what I've just been talking about, about triumphing over hardships and challenges and showing up and being brave. And so um, we'll go right into it. <clears throat> okay, so thank you guys for being here. And uh, Dave, you've been very successful in professional baseball for years as a player, manager, owner, coach, and scout. And were the, you were the first player to play baseball on crutches. Am I getting that all correct? Yeah, except okay. that I wasn't always successful. <laughs> okay. Well, that's, that's all of us, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and and the question is, what was it like to play playing baseball with these challenges, and how were you received by people, and what teams did you work with? Okay. Um, it's like three let's questions. go back to the beginning. I had polio <laughs> when I was ten months old. Okay. Um, Thank goodness I had not learned how to walk yet. So I didn't have to transition from learning how to walk, from walking to learning to do things a different way. So I was taken from my parents for a year, about a year. I was in a reconstruction home. Um, and when I came out, I was almost two years old and was walking with two full length leg braces and crutches. Uh, fast forward, um, I have two brothers, uh, my parents, I think a key to, uh, Kim kind of touched on it, reaching potential. I think a key of that is a lot of times when parents, caregivers have children with limitations, they reel the leash in very tight and they don't let them explore uh, different activities, different likes. And uh, so if you don't do that, you never find out what your potential is because you don't find out what your strengths are. And uh, my parents never, when I said I wanted to play baseball, they didn't say, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. Can't was not a word in the Clark household. Mm -hmm. um, the only time I can remember kind of having a hesitant 
mother was when I said I wanted to play ice hockey. <laughs> and uh, she uh, she finally said, okay, but the first time you come home missing a tooth, you're done. <laughs> so, so thank God I never lost any teeth. Um, but um, it was not an easy path. Uh, you know, I, and once I got to school, to, to grade school, uh, I never felt any different growing up until I got to grade school. And once I got to grade school, bullying is not a new thing. Mm-hmm. It's existed for as long as mankind. Mm-hmm. And I was made to feel different when I got to school. Yeah. Uh, but I still, uh, and, and there's a couple stories that I could relate. I don't know how much time we have, but um, there were a couple of very important stories along my path that kind of created the path that I took. Um, but the baseball, um, you know, I wanted to play little league and little league said, you can't play, you'll get hurt, you'll get injured. And my parents literally drove to Williamsport, which is about an hour from my hometown of Corning, New York. They literally drove to the world headquarters of little league and said, and they battled for me Hmm. and they ended up winning the battle. So I ended up playing Little League Baseball. I found out I could hold my own against so-called able-bodied kids. There was no challenger then. And that that brings up another point that I always make. Had challenger existed back when I was a kid, I'd have probably been channeled directly into challenger because of my appearance, walking with crutches and braces. I would have been put into challenger. That would not, in my case, have helped me reach my potential because I was a little bit above that level and I was holding my own against able-bodied kids. And when I got to 16, 14, 15, 16, I had a dream of, of every kid in that era of playing professional baseball. And I, Um, I knew my strengths and I realized that I was never going to get there. I was a pitcher and I realized I couldn't throw hard enough to let any scout probably get interested in me. Mm -hmm. So I thought outside of the box, I said, what can I do to draw attention to myself? that could be successful in me getting to that next level. And I came up with a knuckleball. I don't know if you know what that is. I've heard of it. But it's it's a pitch that is not thrown hard, but it floats like a butterfly. Mm -hmm. And if it's it's thrown correctly, it's a very difficult pitch to hit. Mm -hmm. So I was topping out my fastball at 79 miles an hour. Oh my God. And which is very slow. You can catch that. You could catch that with a Kleenex in the pros uh-huh. and, and, uh, the knuckleball. So then I developed the knuckleball and it took a long time, a couple of years to get it to where I thought it was, it would work. Uh, but that was coming in, you know, at 60, 63, maybe. Um, so at that point, and, and this is something I always tell people, as far as my baseball career goes, I realized my chances of getting to the pro level were pretty slim and none, Mm -hmm. but I still put in the work and the effort with no guarantee I was ever going to get a chance. And that is so important. I go into pro locker rooms, college locker rooms, high school locker rooms today. And I tell the kids, you're not guaranteed anything in life, but you've got to work like you are going to get that chance. Cause if you put the effort in, and the chance comes, now you're ready. You're ready for that opportunity. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if you don't put the work in and the opportunity comes, it's going to float right by you. Yeah. So, so, so I was doing my workout four hours a day, six days a week, uh, running five miles a day on the crutches, lifting weights, riding a stationary bike, all those things, knowing that my chance of getting looked at were pretty, 
pretty slim. Yeah. The next thing I did was I took the effort to hand write 24 letters, one to every major league club in existence at that time, expressing my, and I look back now and I think how absurd that was. <laughs> Here's this guy writing to major league general managers on crutches and braces said, Hey, <clears throat> give me a chance. <laughs> and, uh, I got three replies out of the 24 and I got oh. one chance oh. and I was ready. I got the Perfect. one, cha I got the one chance. Uh, I parlayed that. And again, it wasn't easy, but I parlayed that into a 40 some year career uh, of being in professional baseball. And you talked about how I was accepted. I was not. Uh. I was uh, not accepted even by my own teammates. Mm. Uh, I didn't fit the mold. Yeah. Uh, it's a pretty closed uh, fraternity, professional uh. sports, and you yes. got to look the part. Now, I was built up upper body wise, but here I am on crutches and braces, and I'm walking into a locker room and I'm taking somebody's job. Mm. Somebody's being pushed out because I'm coming in and that didn't sit well. And so probably for about two weeks, I was a man on an Island. Mm -hmm. uh, teammates wouldn't talk to me, wouldn't associate with me. Uh, so I wasn't just battling the opponent. I was battling my own team. Um, and then, uh, after about two weeks, um, you know, when I would get to the stadium ahead of everybody else and I would be running in the outfield when they got there and I would be getting people out after about two weeks, the tide started to turn. And when it turned, it turned big time because, um, uh, when they got my back, they really had it. Mm. it. It was almost like your brother. It was like, I can hit my brother in the face with my fist, but don't you do it. Uh, and, and it was, the, it was that much of a turnaround from not wanting to associate with me to don't, don't mess with him because yeah. we got his back. Wow. And, and so that was, uh, I don't know if that, it, that was a long winded answer to your question. It's so it's interesting though. Yeah. Fascinating. I was like, <laughs> like a movie. And I think you, you do have a documentary or a movie, right? About your life. There's a, there's a short documentary that was put out okay. years ago, but there is a movie in the works, let's say. Oh, okay. Um, oh. but did you, did you feel when they were finally coming around to accept you, was it because during the two weeks that they didn't, you stayed strong in who you were or like, what was it? Do you think that made them finally come around? I think they saw my work work ethic. Mm. I, I, I kept my nose clean. Um, you know, I could have, I could have rebelled against them for yeah. ostracizing me, but I didn't, I just, you know, kept to myself, did my job, uh, you know, really was putting in a lot of work. I had to work at least twice as hard as anybody else to stay where I, where I got, I mean, uh, it wasn't easy. And, and, uh, there's a lot of guys that with a lot more talent than I had that didn't make it. And that's because this thing between your, your ears is very important. Um, I always say, if you think you can, you can, if you don't think you can, you haven't got a shot. Yes. And, um, I always thought I could, and I, I uh, you know, one way or another, I always thought until somebody tells me I can't and I'm not good enough, I'm going to keep going. And it, like I said, it wasn't easy. I got released, I got cut, but I always found another team to play with. And uh, I was like the guitar man in that song. Uh, I just got to find another place to play. <laughs> <laughs> That song's too old for these girls. Probably is. <laughs> I don't know Probably what it is. is. <laughs> yeah, we're only 21. No. Yeah, yeah. We are. I, I imagine we're older than you think we are. 
Hopefully. Well, you're, not a, you're not as old as Dave. How's that? Okay. <laughs> so, Dave, you also um, do motivational speaking. And have you you've done a TED Talk, too? Yes, I did. So. I don't remember when it was, but it was quite a few years ago. It's yeah, a, it's, I did one. It's, it's a great ago. talk. What What do you usually focus on when you're doing your talk? You know, it depends on who we're talking to, because I can, I can speak on a lot of different subjects. I can speak on overcoming. I can speak on management, because I was, you know, I, was, I went into coaching, and and. I think one of the strengths I had as a coach was getting to know all of my players' strengths as best I could and plugging them into a lineup where I thought they would have the best chance for success. And I think you can do that anywhere, in business, in, in you know, whatever walk of life you're going through um, or that you're in, I think you can, uh, you know, if you're in a management position, it's your job to know what your employees strengths are so that you can put them in a spot where they can help the, the, the club, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, so I can speak, I, don't, I can speak to kids. I love speaking to kids. Uh, I can speak on overcoming. I can speak on management. Um, so we kind of tailor and I speak the, the, the most, the best for me anyway, the best uh, thing is speaking in the locker rooms. To the, to the players because um, I can relate and I can um, I think I come across there um, pretty strong mm -hmm. and, do you feel and, like the culture is still like a fraternity yep yeah yep yeah <laughs> definitely definitely um, but I think uh, when I walk I, well I, I give you a, I give you a quick story we were in Nashville doing doing one of our camps and uh, the players from the Nashville Sounds came to the clubhouse a little bit late because they had played a uh, extra inning game the night before and they had two rain delays the night before and uh, so they came in a little bit late and Doug, Doug stayed with the participants. Doug normally goes into the clubhouse with me but he stayed with the participants to keep them occupied while I went in and address the late coming players. And this, they, they didn't send the general manager in, they sent, I think the assistant general manager in. And he kept trying to, uh, here I am, you know, a little five foot two guy coming in. They don't know me from Adam. And, and they manage, the system manager is trying to get their attention. And he keeps going out, fellas, I'd like to introduce, and they wouldn't listen. They're, they're just, they just kept, mingling with each other and they wouldn't let and I did I listened to this three times he tried to get a, their attention three times I listened three times and after the third time they kept doing the same thing I I, I just uh, all of a sudden fellas I want your attention and I want it now <laughs> wow thank you for listening to talk purpose and truth podcast Find out more at TalkPurposeAndTruth.com and follow us at TalkPurposeTruth on Instagram and Facebook.